want to specifically talk to you about today about uh, who is man. But I want to ask you to kind of keep your, your mind engaged because it's more teaching and not preaching. It may not be as entertaining. I don't have the jokes I usually have or the illustrations. And so keep your mind engaged because it's always so easy to start wandering and think about, gee, what, what are we going to do when we get home from church today? You know, or what's happening this week? And all of a sudden, we've got to almost fight to keep your mind engaged. So I'd ask that you would do that uh, and that you would try to pull out today something out of the sermon that will make you stronger, that make you better, that make you know more and, and allow the Holy Spirit to just get deep into you today. And, uh, and realize that God has something to say to you every time we open up the Bible, whether it be a small group, a connection group, whether it be any Sunday, God always has something to say to you, amen? Well, in Genesis, I want to start today that who is man? Who is man? I feel like uh, Vince Lombardi this morning, that he was one of the most famous coaches in the world, and, and uh, he would coach a pro team, and these pro players came out of, of playing high school ball and college ball. And then he gets all these guys are now paid these salaries and he sit them down the room and he holds up a football and he says, gentlemen, we start with this. This is a football. And so today I want to start with this. This is man and understand who we are and what we deal with as man. And when I say man, I mean mankind, men and women. So women, you're, you're not off the, off the list here. So uh, Genesis 126 says this, then God said, who said it? God said, let us, you get it, let us, interesting us, who's us? But let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish and the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. Now, I'm using the new King James. We have the King James up there, and a lot of you had an NIV, so follow you. We have different translations. But I want us to understand that it says, let us and get into our likeness. Well, who is us and who is our? You know, the word God in Hebrew that is translated here is plural, and it means gods. And so we're talking about a supreme God, but we're also talking about a supreme gods. Well, who are these gods? In this verse, it's showing us what we call the triunity of the Godhead, three in one. We have the Godhead. It's plural, being God, yet it's also sing, uh, plural, meaning many, but also singular, meaning one. And so you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and that's where we talk about the Trinity. The word Trinity isn't in the Bible. It's something that we've said as describing the three in one. We call it the Trinity. The word likeness here is is. It's a resemblance. It's, it's a model or a shaping. The strong exhaustive, exhaustive concordance talks about it. It's a fashion or a like, resemblance, the likeness. Realize today that we have been made in the likeness of God. Well, how does God look? Maybe if he looked in the mirror, God doesn't look so good. No, just kidding. But no, it's not meaning facial, does it? But God is spirit. In, in, in John 4, 24, it says this, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Those who worship God must worship in spirit. And I talked about that a little bit. We get so used to in the United States of doing everything in the natural that we forget that there's a supernatural. Suzanne and I went to the Solomon Islands for a month on a missions trip. It's before we even came here. And uh, we sent our kids to grandma for a while to <laughs> while we went to the, on mission. And, uh, and it was life transforming for Suzanne and I because there they put an emphasis on the supernatural, not on the natural. And when everything happens in the natural, they always look for a supernatural for an explanation. And, and we, because we're in America, we don't need this. We don't need God. We don't need miracles because we have welfare. We have programs. We can, there's not need in America. You want need, go to a third world. That's where you see need. And all they have to depend on is the supernatural workings of God. And so we tend to, to not operate in the spirit. 
and we don't realize that when we talk about God, that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. We have a spirit because we are made like our Father. And from my understanding, my take on things, that there's no other creature on the planet that has been, been created that has a spirit, only man. The spirit of man is eternal, so every person has an eternal destiny. The spirit of man is eternal. Catch this. So every person has the eternal destiny. Every person. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The word of God divides between spirit and soul of man who lives and that lives in the body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this, now, you may, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and, you, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's three parts of man. We've talked about the triunity of God, the trinity of God, the, the three parts of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and each one has a distinct personality, if you will. Well, man is broken up into three different parts. It's triune also. The spirit, the soul, and the body. And it's interesting here in Thessalonians, I'd say, now, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. Well, what is sanctification? Broke down in the most purest form is to be made holy. Well, to be, what does it mean to be made holy? It means that we're set apart as something special. You know, it's interesting when uh, in Thessalonians, uh, in Ephesians, it talks about, and now women, here we go, that women are a weaker vessel. And man, you just, you know, the hairs stand up on the way. What do you mean women are the weaker vessel? Well, a translation of that men and women is that it really means it's a special vessel. It's something that would be made out of crystal that you'd put up on a shelf in honor because it was something that's very, very special very expensive, something that you just don't, isn't ordinary. Isn't that good, women, to know that? And us men need to treat you that way. Amen. There. Guys always get beat up in our church, and women are always honored. That's what I hear from the guys a lot. <laughs> How come on Mother's Day that, that, that you always bless the women? On Father's Day, you just beat us up. Well, if the shoe fits, wear it, I say. But um, where was I? Okay. But to be sanctified, meaning that really, that God says that we're made special and a place of honor to be able to be of something of special and purpose to him. He wants us to be of value to him. For what? To be a part of what he's trying to do in the kingdom, to be part of his, his to be his family. We're a family member. We're inherited now and we've been adopted into his family. How special would it be to be at the White House? Do you live at the White House? To be a president's son or daughter, that would be pretty special, wouldn't it? Or to be in England and to be a part of, you know, the, the queen and be part of the family there. That would be, everyone would honor, there's something special about that. We have something better. God has called us his sons. And he's the king of king and lord of lords. That's our inheritance. We are special. Turn to someone next to you and say, you are special. So we are spirit. We are spirit who has a soul that lives in a body. I want to first start off with say, talking about the spirit of man. We have been created in the image of God himself. And we, too, have a spirit within us. Genesis 2.7 says this, And the Lord God formed man in the, of the dust and, and of the ground. You know, we're just dirt, okay? But then he says, And he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. 
God did not call a man into existence. He breathed him into existence with his breath, with his spirit. He breathed life into man. Man had the ability to walk in the garden and to fellowship with father, with daddy. In Genesis 3, 8, it said that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. When man sinned, his whole life changed. That relationship changed. He, he no longer was allowed to be in the presence of God as he once was able to do because sin entered into that relationship. So Adam and Eve lost the closeness of father. They lost the closeness of being able to call Abba, Father, Daddy. And all of a sudden, that relationship was strained. But all throughout and for the future, God had planned a redemption, a buying back of mankind, if you will, through the second Adam, the second Adam being Jesus Christ, his son. To this point, mankind, they, they died in their spirit at that point because of sin. And there was a change. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Satan totally had lied in the garden when he said, You shall not surely die. That was a lie. They died spiritually, and then eventually they died physically. And neither was the desire of God. Death and disease, and all the stuff we have today was not in God's plan. God gets blamed for a lot of things that, that was entered in when, when Adam and Eve, when mankind was deceived, and sin entered into the world. Man's spirit is dead without the blood of Christ. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no remission. Ephesians 2 says, who were dead in the trespasses of sins. And it says, even when we're dead in our trespasses. First Peter says, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light? When a person received Jesus into their heart, the spirit all of a sudden comes alive. And that's why we say so much that someone who's not a non-Christian, they don't understand the things of God. They can't see the Spirit because the Spirit is dead within them. Isn't it interesting that the world looks today, you've got at, at spiritual things, but it's all of, um, name some of the programs out there, para this and para that and all these things of seances and trying to find this and that. Even they have the police that they try to find clues from a dead person. You know, all these different things of looking for ghosts. There's... There's, I think, in, in all of us, because there's a spirit in us, there's something in us that yearns and wants to see what is this supernatural thing. But it's only when someone receives Jesus in their heart that they come alive in their spirit to really understand the spirit of God. Those who do not receive Jesus are still eternal, but their eternal is separation from Jesus, and we call that hell because their spirits were not washed in the blood of Jesus, and they die in their sins. Romans 3.23 goes on to say, it first says, For all sins have fallen short of glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a prohibition by his blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. And so Romans 5, 8 and 10 says, but then God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, so much more have been reconciled, we shall be saved. By his life. Now we are saved by the blood. If you've received and asked Jesus to come into your life, and you've been able to say that sinner's prayer, saying, God, forgive me for my sins, and I, I just want to nail them to the cross right now, and I ask you to come into my life, and I receive you now 
as my Lord and Savior. Our spirit man becomes alive in Christ. And the goal and the lifelong battle, get this, the lifelong battle is to be led by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, who lives inside of us. Why? It's because we have a carnal nature now, the sinful nature, the flesh nature, always in battle with the spiritual nature. And I've said this time and time again, the man you feed is a man that's stronger. The spirit of man is possessed by the spirit of God. And our spirit then comes in submission. And so we want to be led by the spirit, not led by ourselves. And so it's a daily of, of, of being able to just die to ourselves and say, flesh, man, get out of here. I don't want to be led by flesh today. I want to be led by the spirit of God. It's a daily of dying to self, dying to ego, dying to pride, and be able to say, spirit of God, you today I serve. I pray that every day, every day. You today I want to serve. It may not last too long because my flesh comes in and I stumble over the old flesh there, but it's still something I do and want to do every day. Die to self and let God arise. The second part is the soul of a man. Every person and every animal is born with the soul. Well, what is the soul? The soul is the intellect. It's, it's how we think and we understand. The soul is our emotions. It's how we feel. The soul is our will, our desires, and our decisions. I'm going to break that down in just a minute, but, but when man does not know Jesus, he is led by his soulish realm. The Bible terms it in his flesh. All he has is intellect, emotions, and will. And some, most people can do a pretty good job with that. But it's lacking what? The Holy Spirit. It's lacking God. Romans 7 uh, verse 6 says this, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Romans seven eighteen says, for I know that in me, that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. For, it will, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. And basically he's saying, I, I, I've got this flesh in me that's always there. And I've got the spirit of God that's in there. And there's a battle that takes place. But in the earlier scripture, we should learn, we should strive, we should, we should spend our time. How do we serve the newness of our spirit? Because without it, without working at that, without, without really, the Bible says to work out your salvation. And I believe when Paul was saying that, he is saying working out how to serve in the newness of our spirit. You got to serve somebody. You're either going to serve the devil or you're going to serve the Lord. If you're serving yourself, if you're serving your ego, if you're serving man, you're not serving God, are you? You got to learn. You got to work at serving God. The soul of man was created by God to be controlled by the spirit of God and, and not have the spirit controlled by flesh. Our intellect is important. That's a part of our soul. It was created as the most brilliant of all his creation. God created man with, with intellect. He created us to think and to understand and to reason. That's how our mind works. In 1 Corinthians, it, it says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Saying that, you know, we think we're so smart, and some of us think we're so good. But it said, even in God's weakness, he is stronger than us. And he's a whole lot smarter. When our mind is not controlled by God, then the mind of man can move in evil and destruction rather than life. We can choose in our mind not to go down certain roads if we focus on what we can do to bring life, to speak life, to live life. 
Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in its way, it, it leads to death. The challenge is having our minds transformed by the words. Romans 12, 2 says this, and not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I know when I was a new Christian and I was raised in a construction field and, you know, all the language, all the dirty jokes, all the everything, the walls of the shop had Playboy pictures and all that, and it was pretty a, a bad environment. And I was raised in that. And this verse became an important thing that my mind would be transformed by the renewing of my mind in God's word and in his spirit. I wanted my life to be transformed from the world. I, I didn't want the world to dictate how I thought, how I lived, and, and, it, and, it, and you got to cut it off at the root. The tree grows, you got to cut it off the root. I couldn't just cut down the branches. I had to cut it at the roof and, and completely transform my life. There's a period of time that I'd only listen to Christian radio and Christian Bible studies, and I would go to a Bible study when I was in high school, I, it didn't matter what church I was in. I would go to several different churches. Where every night of the week, I, I was almost like alcohol's anonymous. I didn't even know what that was back then. But I was just Jesus. I, I just wanted Jesus. And so I, I went to every Bible study I could get my hands on during the week because I wanted to learn about this thing called God. I wanted to learn how, even though I was raised in the church, I didn't know how to live now as a Christian. And so I wanted to just feed my body, feed my soul, feed my spirit, to feed my intellect with the things of God. First Corinthians 2.16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that, that we may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And that's what I wanted. I wanted the mind of Christ. I, wanted, I didn't want the mind of John McConnell. I wanted the mind of Christ. I didn't want the mind of the world. I didn't want the mind of any world. I wanted the mind of Christ. And you have to work at that. It just doesn't come. It just doesn't come. You've got to work at that in your life. The battle of our lives is, is the mind of man. And 2 Corinthians 3, uh, 10, 3 through 6 says this. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, for casting arguments on every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captive to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your disobedience is fulfilled. You know, we cannot trust our mind and our thoughts. We can't just rely on that. We got to rely on becoming and, and learning the mind of Christ. Amen? Another part of our soul is our emotions. So many of us are controlled by our emotions. It controls us. It dictates us. We're on, we're on a roller coaster of our emotions up and down. Sometimes you you, you, when someone walks in the room, you can, man, they're just wearing it out on their sleeves. In, in a sense, our life, we have emotion. We're emotional people, and that's okay. God himself, you realize this? God himself was emotional, and we're created in his, in his image. In Kings, it says our king gets angry. In Genesis, it says our king gets sad. In Zephaniah, it says, our king gets happy. In 1 John, our king loves. In Exodus, our king gets jealous. In Psalms, it says, our king is compassionate. The list goes on and on of emotions that God has. When Lazarus died and, 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 the, and his two sisters came to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, why weren't you there? What was his response? He cried. He had emotion. Well, that, that just blows my mind. He cried. He didn't try to give excuses. He didn't say, well, I'm God and I can take care of this. No, he, he felt that emotion. He, he, he sympathized. He was, he was right there with them in that time of their grief. And he just sat and cried. And then Lazarus was healed came to life. 
The only emotion that God has not experienced, think about this, just think about this. The only emotion that God has never experienced, can you think what that might be? Fear. Fear. The emotion was engaged when man sinned and hid in the garden. All of a sudden, fear was started. Fear is the opposite of faith. And I believe it was installed of, because of man's sin. Fear is the opposite of faith. Our goal is to control our emotions, not to have our emotions control us. As Christians, we walk differently than people who are controlled by their emotions. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, We walk by faith, not by sight. Meaning that, our faith needs to be stronger than what we sense, what we see, what we feel, what we think. Our faith has got to be stronger than that. If we don't have faith, then what do we have? Our whole life should be built on faith. So what is facing us in the natural, we've got to have more faith in the supernatural to combat that is before us in the natural. When a person is controlled by their emotions, they, they make decisions according to the emotion and is stimulated by circumstances rather than be led by the Holy Spirit. Beloved, no longer are you a slave in the emotional realm, but your emotions have to be aligned themselves with the Word of God <coughs> in your faith. Put your trust in your faith, and that battles the fear. And then the third part of man this morning is the physical body. And the physical body is nothing more than a slave to our spirit or our soulish man, to our spirit man or our soulish man. In Galatians 5, 24 and 23, it talks about walking in the spirit. It says, those who are, those who are, uh, are Christ have crucified the flesh and with its passions and its desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Again, it takes work to not be in the flesh, but be in the Spirit. A lot of times I have to ask myself, and sometimes when someone says something or does something, my reaction, is it out of the Spirit or is it out of the flesh? And sometimes things happen and they're called triggers. I'm reading a book called Triggers right now, and it's not even written by Christians, but it's a great book of how you react to certain things. And and sometimes someone says something that triggers in you react. It's usually the wrong reaction. And, you know, I have, we all have them. And it's learning to be able to realize the trigger before you react to that. Because usually the reaction is not good. And in the long run, it's just not good. And so we all have triggers in our life. And we got to realize that are we operating in the flesh that we let that trigger come out, bang. Or in the spirit, we're not reactive, we're proactive. We're not reacting to situations. We're allowing God to say, would you work in this and let me learn from this, God? I'm not going to just react to this situation before me. If we walk in the flesh, then we're, we're controlled by the soulish man. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8, it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he also reaps, for he sows what his flesh will, will of the flesh. For what he sows in his flesh, the flesh will reap corruption. But what he sows in his spirit, the spirit will also, it says here, recap everlasting life. Will, will reap everlasting life. So what you plant, you will harvest. So if you're, if you're planting and seeding things in the spirit, in, in, in the supernatural, if you're, planting, if, you're, if you're planting things that are, are good and you're planting things from the spiritual nature that you have, you're going to reap that. If you plant things in the, in, and sow things in the flesh, you reap that. And let me tell you, you know, even me as a pastor, sometimes, like I say, I trigger, I say something stupid. Well, now I've got a mess I've got to clean up. You know, it's like, you know, you got a mess. And, and we all have it. We all do it. 
whether talking with our friends, our workplace, our school, whatever it may, we always got to be on guard. Because why? It's because we need to learn to continue to walk in the Spirit. And it's always a battle going on of how we're reacting and what we're working in. Look at your life this morning. Would you allow the Holy Spirit just to speak to you? I'm just so amazed at people who call themselves Christians. But then they put aside principles that are in the Bible and they allow themselves to really be carnal, fleshly, and make decisions and live in that. Why they think everything is just fine and dandy. And then they wonder why there isn't a closeness to God or why things aren't going as good as they should and, and why God, why God, why? Well, God put a blueprint of how we should live and what we should do. Why do we ignore that and say, well, you know, it's, it's really not contemporary anymore and everyone else is doing it, so it's okay if I do it. That's soulish. How much soul do you have that you're living in the soulish realm and how much you are allowing yourself to, to live in the spirit, man? Galatians 2.20, and this is my, well, almost my closing scripture. I'll get there in just a minute. Our ultimate goal and challenge in life is be led and governed by the Holy Spirit. Are you allowing yourself to be led and governed by the Holy Spirit? The more you allow him to live through you, the more you will learn to yield and not give in to that soulish man, but let the spirit man be the real you. None of us are going to be perfect at it. None of us will. But Galatians 2.20 uh, 2 is one of my life verses, and I hope you have life verses. I hope you have verses that, that you say are my life verses, that it spoke to me when I was a young in Christ, and I've kept it with me. This is one of my life verses, that I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but, but Christ lives through me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who, who loved me, and he gave himself for me. I, I've needed to say that time and time again. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I. What am I saying? It's no longer the soulish man that lives. I don't want that. I don't want my carnal nature to come out. But I want, I want Jesus, his life, and who he is. And I want my daddy. I, I want to be, be a reflection. I've been made in his image. So I want that image to shine through my life. Would you stand? Bow your heads and your hearts this morning. Hi, I'm Pastor John McConnell, and I'd like to welcome you today for watching our program. It's just amazing the technology we have today that we're able to live stream all around the world. And we'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to give towards this ministry, you can go online and be able to uh, follow the directions that are on there and be able to give to the ministry that you've been watching. So God bless you. We thank you for being part of Southside Alliance Church today.